So let me get this straight. It took Toho five years to produce a sequel to a successful Godzilla film, yet they only took two years to make a sequel to a not-so-successful film? Now is it me or is there something odd about this business plan? People of the internet, this is Gaijin Noir here with a review for the 1991 film Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. The first Godzilla film of the 90s, as well as the film that reintroduced King Ghidorah for a new generation of moviegoers after having been absent for almost 20 years. The plot of this film begins in the present year of 1992, where a mysterious UFO has been spotted all over the globe. When it lands in the middle of Japan, the UFO's pilots reveal themselves to be humans from the year 2204 who traveled back in time to help Japan in preventing their destruction at the hands of Godzilla. In order to erase Godzilla's existence from the timeline, the Futurians obtain the help of several knowledgeable Japanese citizens, including Miki Sagusa, the psychic from the previous film, paleontologist Professor Mizaki, and our protagonist Kenichiro Terasawa, a journalist with aspirations of writing a novel on Godzilla's origins based on the research he recently acquired. As soon as preparations are all set, the team travels to the year 1945 on Lagos Island, smack dab in the middle of World War II. There, they witness the dinosaur that would eventually become Godzilla, interrupting a battle between the American and Japanese soldiers. Once the Godzillasaurus is left alone, the team transports the creature to the bottom of the ocean, thus preventing it from ever being mutated by the nuclear tests that would take place on that island in 1954. Once our protagonists return to the present, they find that a new beast had taken Godzilla's place during the nuclear tests, as the triple-headed terror known as King Ghidorah awakens to destroy Japan. Realizing that the Futurians had betrayed them, the protagonists are assisted by Shindo, a wealthy businessman who was there during the Battle of Lagos Island. Because he had great respect for the dinosaur that saved his life, he sends a nuclear submarine to help recreate Godzilla. But little do they know, a newer, stronger Godzilla is born to reclaim his title as King of the Monsters. While the last entry in the series was pretty out there in terms of its tone and concepts, this film certainly takes things in an even more crazy direction with the introduction of time travel. Thanks to this plot device, audiences finally get the definitive origin story for Godzilla, which had always been hinted at in previous films. The constant theme of Godzilla's impact on the world is still here to ground the plot in some level of seriousness and believability. I absolutely love the idea of mankind attempting to fix their mistakes of the past, only to realize that it is impossible to erase what they've done. Much like in real life, our heroes learn that they must acknowledge these mistakes in order to create a better future. This carries over with the villains themselves. Where they come from, Japan gained the political power to surpass that of today's first world countries. Rather than attempt to fix the problems of their world, these political terrorists were desperate enough to simply wipe out Japan in the past, only to deal with forces they could not control. The film also brilliantly uses a concept seen in other time travel narratives, in which there are certain events in history you can change no matter how hard you try, because the time stream would then make sure to put things back in place. Here this idea is applied to Godzilla. Despite being sent to the bottom of the ocean as a normal dinosaur, the Godzillasaurus eventually became Godzilla in the 70s due to the large amounts of nuclear waste dropped into the ocean. So when Shindo sends his submarine to nuke the Godzillasaurus, he accidentally creates a new Godzilla, stronger, larger, and more enraged for what mankind has done to him yet again. This poetic rebirth of Godzilla clearly shows that in this universe, Godzilla is a punisher of humanity that will always remain present as long as mankind refuses to change their destructive methods. Now as great as the story is, there are certain plot holes that will most likely leave your head scratching, such as how the Godzillasaurus would be able to survive underwater before mutating into Godzilla, or how Shindo could have access to a nuclear submarine when the return of Godzilla emphasized how much the Prime Minister refused to allow such weaponry to exist in Japan. 
However, the most egregious and perhaps most infamous plot hole in the entire Godzilla series is the fact that when our protagonist returns in 1992, everyone still has memories of the old Godzilla, despite supposedly erasing him from existence. Now for years, the fandom has attempted to justify this plot hole by explaining the existence of two separate Godzillas, one from 1954 and the other being the 80s Godzilla, and that our team of time travelers erased one, but not the other allowing some of the previous events to exist. Other fans have developed even more complicated theories, claiming that the time travel in this film created a parallel universe where things remain the same no matter what was done to the past. However, as a good friend of mine once said, sometimes the most simplest explanations are the ones that are most likely true. My belief is that the writer of this film wanted to make a time travel based film but didn't want to deal with all of the wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey details and consequences that come with writing a time travel story. So rather than spend screen time on having the protagonist get everybody up to speed on who and what Godzilla is, the writer must have thought it was easier to simply have everyone remember him in order to move the plot along. Plot details aside, the cast for Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah is a bit of a mixed bag, with some characters outshining others. Kenichiro is probably the least interesting protagonist we've had so far in the Heisei series. He feels derivative of Maki from Return of Godzilla, in that, like him, Kenichiro is another journalist looking for the truth with ambitions of making a big break in his career, this time moving away from speculative science fiction pieces and more towards more serious non-fiction stories. Outside of this tidbit of information, he's a pretty basic character. From what we've seen in the film, he's a headstrong hothead who would easily stand up for his country and would willingly fight the villains. But beyond that, there's no other compelling motivation for his actions outside of his friendship with Emmy, who we'll talk about later. But in the end, he's still likable enough to get behind. Mickey this time around has a much less prominent role despite her extended amount of screen time. She does next to absolutely nothing except keeping track of Godzilla's location at the beginning of the film and detecting him again after they thought they successfully erased him from history. Finally, Professor Mizaki is yet another scientist who is here to dish out exposition in order to help Kenichiro uncover the origins of Godzilla. And like Kenichiro, there's very little here to make him compelling, unlike other expository characters we've seen before. Although what's neat here for diehard Godzilla fans is that he's portrayed by Katsuhiko Sasaki, who previously played the leading role in both Godzilla vs. Megalon and Terror of Mechagodzilla during the 70s. Now outside of this trio, however, is when the fun really starts. The Futurian Emi Kano, portrayed by the late Anna Nakagawa, is who I consider to be the true hero of the story. She starts out as being a naive follower of her colleagues Wilson and Grinchko, believing that they would be solving their problems of controlling Japan through peaceful means. This does raise questions, however, as she appeared absolutely shocked when King Ghidorah is used to destroy Japan, despite the fact that she herself was directly responsible for creating him in the first place. Did she thought that they were going to use Ghidorah as an empty threat in order to force Japan to do their bidding? Well, besides this plot hole, she embodies the theme of learning from the past since she decides to fight against her former comrades in order to help the people of 1992, literally preserving the past so that their country can have a future to look forward to. This helps give Kenichiro a slight bit of character progression as he is motivated by her actions to continue doing what he has passion for even in the darkest of hours. Now Wilson and Grinchko are very typical villains that you would see in a James Bond film, where they gloat about how superior they are as they attempt to stomp on Japan like the bugs they think they are. While very basic, they are certainly entertaining to watch. Even more entertaining is Android M11 himself. This character, portrayed by Robert Scott Field, is an unabashed ripoff of the Terminator, going so far as to even duplicate the on-foot car chase scene from Terminator 2. Sure, that movie only came out four and a half months before Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, but considering how fast it takes for Toho to produce these films, I highly doubt that they didn't take a page out of James Cameron's book. Anyway, M11 is incredibly charismatic, and the actor portraying him looks like he's having the time of his life, which only puts a smile on my face, equaling that of the reaction I get when watching Jet Jaguar. Now, if only they made a feature film featuring both characters. Oh my god! Finally, there's Shindo, the former World War II soldier turned successful businessman. Due to having been saved by the Godzillasaurus all those years ago, Shindo idolizes the dinosaur, and at first refuses to believe that the creature and Godzilla are one and the same. 
most likely because there is some part of him that feels guilty for leaving the wounded creature on Lagos Island, and would most likely would have preferred it live the rest of its natural life in peace, as opposed to living forever as a mutated and rage-filled monster. Yoshio Tsuchiya, who previously appeared in several Godzilla films and Ultraman TV shows in the 60s, brings his A-game here with a truly memorable performance that is sure to bring you to tears. If you were to ask any Godzilla fan what the most emotionally powerful moment was in the franchise, his scene with Godzilla near the climax always gets mentioned. While some have interpreted this scene as being comedic, it's actually meant to be a tragic scene, with Shindo coming to grips that the dinosaur he has idolized for so long is indeed the destructive force of nature that is out to destroy the very city he helped create. With this in mind, he feels that the only way to atone for his sins against Godzilla would be to willingly give his life to the creature that extended it in the first place. The special effects, while a spectacle to behold, aren't as consistently executed as those in the previous film. The experimental effects used to portray M11's superhuman speed and agility lead to the film's most unintentionally funny moments only tied by the American actors, which at this point is a given for the Heisei series. Got him! Take that, you dinosaur! The sets and model work are outstanding as always. Both the designs of the time machine and its interiors have an almost clean and sleek Star Trek look to it. As for the suits, they are impressive in some aspects, but begin to show some of Koichi Kawakita's weaknesses as a special effects director. To point out the highlight, we have Godzilla himself, sporting a refurbished version of the 1989 suit, but with exaggerated and bulked up proportions. It certainly stands out against other designs, and does look like a different creature despite being the same suit, which certainly helps the narrative. While this suit is a fan favorite amongst Godzilla enthusiasts, I'm personally not in love with it as I once was, especially after watching the film in HD. I get why the creature has such large proportions, but the chest and calves look almost like cartoonish tumors growing on his body. It's not a tumor. It's not a tumor at all. However, I can get used to these features. What I can't stand are the numerous folds and creases on his arms and waist, which personally ruins the illusion that this is meant to be more than a suit. Though I suppose the fact that this is a refurbished two-year-old suit would explain the lost elasticity of the skin. The redeeming feature of this suit is its expressive face. During Godzilla's entrance, the suit is shot in a way that makes the eyes almost covered in shadow giving the impression that this new Godzilla is an even more emotionally distant and tortured creature, similar to how some comic book artists would cover a character's eyes in a similar fashion. Both the head and neck, possibly being a separate animatronic, feature much more mobility this time around in close-up shots, which allow for a wider range of movement. These new mechanics certainly help in the film's, and possibly one of the franchise's, most finest moments where Godzilla comes face to face with Shindo in a heartbreaking reunion. Thanks to the work put into the suit, Godzilla is able to match Shindo's sorrow as he allows Godzilla to kill him as retribution for damning this creature to his painful and lonely existence twice. Once when he left him on the island, and again when he himself further mutated him with his sub. Once he is given the okay, Godzilla lets out a mournful cry as he gives into the rage within him and kills the only person that ever showed him sympathy. The dinosaur from Lagos Island is dead, and now only Godzilla remains. These scenes are further enhanced by the film's score, which features the return of musical composer Akira Fakube, who had been scoring the majority of the Godzilla series from 1954 to 1975. In fact, it was his recycled work that was featured in Godzilla vs. Biollante two years prior that inspired him to return to composing music for the franchise and would continue doing so until 1995. King Ghidorah, on the other hand, is definitely a sight for sore eyes. Despite lacking hair in this version, he pretty much looks, acts, and feels just like his classic depiction from the 60s and 70s, right down to being manipulated by technologically advanced antagonists. The new origin given to Ghidorah, while not my preferred take on him, fits the themes associated with the series and goes hand in hand with Biollante's origin, where both creatures exist as a result of Godzilla's presence. Now unlike something like, say, the Amazing Spider-Man films, which attempt to tie every villain to the main character's backstory, these two villain origin stories feel distinct from one another while still tying into this overarching continuity. As for the specifics of Ghidorah's origin, 
The idea that three genetically modified, and absolutely terrifying in my opinion, creatures known as Dorats being mutated into one gigantic entity parallels with Godzilla's origin enough to make them come across like tragic siblings created to fight one another. Both monsters are creatures that were forced against their wills to become horrific abominations. What's intriguing here is that while Godzilla became nature's weapon against mankind, King Ghidorah is used as a weapon of man to be used against himself. Would this make the 90s Ghidorah a closer allegory to the nuclear bombs than Godzilla himself? Who can honestly say? In terms of early 90s era special effects, King Ghidorah's scales are more vibrant and his movements feel more natural, with the exception of his wings and certain flying shots. Sadly, Ghidorah will be the first in the line of Toho monsters during this era to have incredibly stiff wings. At least in the original series, Ghidorah tended to flap his wings whenever he became airborne. Well, for the most part. However, the lack of wing movement during the fighter jet sequence is greatly overshadowed by Mecha King Ghidorah, which looks absolutely stunning. Interesting note, because the suit was over 400 pounds, the special effects team thought it was too dangerous to place an actual suit actor in it, thus they relied exclusively on puppeteering the entire thing. With this information in mind, you'll probably notice why he never walks. Still, the fact that the fight choreography manages to be as complex as it was and even outdo the fight from Godzilla vs. Biollante is another testament to Kawakita and his crew. Much like Biollante, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah suffers from major problems, but comes out in the end as an incredibly entertaining piece of sci-fi cinema. But whereas Biollante suffered from an inconsistent tone, King Ghidorah's main problem is its script and how it skips over important plot details in order to move the story along at a brisk pace. Yet this film manages to deliver on the captivating spectacle and well-written characters we've come to expect from the series, while expanding the lore into uncharted territories. Which is why I'm giving Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah a 4 out of 5. Join me next time when I take a look at the film that brought back another of Godzilla's classic foes, in Godzilla and Mothra, The Battle for Earth. Until next time everybody, take care.